All right, uh, we are in week six, and uh, this week we're going to be covering uh, the topic of the protection of life. Um, there's several subcategories to this, but the over the overarching theme is the protection of life. Now, unfortunately, because uh, because we only have a limited amount of time, I'm only going to be able to cover one. Uh, but uh, if you have the book, there's extensive, extensive, extensive um, thinking on all four of these topics. So if you have the book, uh, I would definitely recommend reading on the other three issues uh, when you're uh, home. But we'll go ahead and mention all four of them now. The first is the, uh, the topic of abortion. Uh, we also have euthanasia, capital punishment, and self-defense. Uh, these are four areas that tend to be controversial when it comes to protecting life, uh, when it comes to how we handle human life. Um, because of time constraints, we're only going to cover abortion because uh, personally, I think this is this is the most pressing issue. Uh, so, of the four, this is the one we're going to talk about. Uh, but that doesn't that doesn't mean that euthanasia, capital punishment, and self defense aren't things that we need to think about. But it's that on the scale of things, if we had to choose, I think that abortion is the one thing that we need to understand the most and be the most concerned about. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the other three. Uh, if we have time at the end of class, we may talk about those briefly. All right, so abortion. The issue um, we're going to talk about, I guess, what it, what it is that we're talking about. What is the, what's the heart of the discussion on abortion? We're going to talk about biblical teaching. We're going to talk about reason and evidence and then objections to the arguments that we're making. So when we're talking about the issue of abortion, and once again, this is, the, this is what it really boils down to. We're not going to be talking about um, as many broad categories as things like should governments, and we're, specifically we're concerned about ours because uh, we're citizens of this nation, but should governments make laws to protect preborn children? Now this term preborn is something that I hadn't seen until I was reading through Dr. Grudem's work, and, um, and I, I like it better uh, because I think it's more accurate um, that we need to consider children who have not been born yet as preborn, not unborn. Um, and I think that when we when we discuss things with people who are um, pro-choice or uh, don't value human life, I think that that term might not be as easy to dismiss as unborn or um, even other terms. For, I mean, for instance, some people will call, um, will call a child in the womb a fetus, which is medically a correct term. I don't have a problem with people. I don't think that that's. I don't think that that's demeaning. I think it's a medical term. But for the sake of argument, I think we need to. We need. We need to remember, and we need to help other people remember that. Uh, medical terminology aside, it's a human being that we're talking about. Um, so, if you use another term such as you know fetus or embryo, I'm not going to say, oh well. You obviously don't respect human life because if you did, you would call it a person. And I'm not going to say that, okay? And um, but I think for the sake of our discussion, the term preborn will probably be the best to use. So another critical kind of central point: when is a person to begin to exist? Uh, we understand through science when a person physically begins to exist, when their body begins to exist, but when does a person begin to exist? Uh, and that means, you know, as opposed to an animal, we have what, what qualities that we possess that differ us, differentiate us from animals, 
when do those exist? When do those begin to exist? So should governments make laws to protect preborn children? When does someone become a person? Should the government assume a moral stance on abortion? In other words, should government say not, not in the, for instance, you can say smoking is unhealthy. Okay, that's a medical point of view. Smoking is unhealthy. But it's different to say smoking is wrong. So that's what I'm asking about abortion. Should the government assume a moral stance on abortion, not just say abortion is unhealthy or abortion is dangerous, but abortion is right or wrong? So that, that's another important thing for us to consider. So I think that these questions will be easier to answer at the end of this discussion, but before we get into it, I want to know what are your initial reactions to these three questions? Should governments make laws to protect preborn children? Yes. Okay. Does anyone want to give a why? Because the preborn child is life and doesn't have the choice whether to live or die. They're not given that opportunity. Okay. So they aren't able to answer for themselves. So someone and you're thinking the government then would be the, the appropriate person to make that, to, to protect that, that, uh, that life. Any other whys? Okay. When does the government get involved in that picture? Isn't it not to call the doctors and the, and the person having the child? line of defense or calling on that particular situation? Okay, so you, you feel that it, the, first, uh, the first person who should be making that decision would be the doctor and the, the person involved, the person, yeah, the okay. woman? Okay, so the government should be involved, but they shouldn't be the uh, the primary decision maker. Okay. Any other reasoning? I mean, just to pull out the like the classic. Well, what if the person or what if the baby that was um, that was killed? What if that was the one person that could cure cancer? Just because okay. you don't know what they could eventually end up doing. So how does that relate to government? That's why they should. Okay, because of contribution to society? Yes. Definitely. Okay. So, when does a person begin to exist? Conception. How do you know that? How old they could be at artificial Okay. So how do we, well, where do you get your, where do you, why do you think it begins at conception? I guess would be the best question. That's how babies are made, I guess. I'm sorry. It's the beginning of life. Okay. How do you know it's the beginning of life? Ultrasound, show you beating hearts, things like that. What about before their heart's there? Well, I, I think it's when it's Okay. Well, like, you can track, like, you can't, like, like, the way that I was kind of heard it is, like, you can go back, you know, I was alive yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. Is there ever a point when I'm not alive? Like, is there ever a point when I'm, like, except for at conception? Like, am I any more alive today, you know, like, more alive one day than another, like, the day after I was conceived? Like, you know, mm -hmm. when does that alive moment start, you know? With okay. Heart? So, and that, that's, that's why this question is... In, in some ways more difficult to answer than the policy kind of question of what should, what should we do about it. But we don't know what to do about it if we don't know what it is that we're talking about in the first place. Yeah, and that really is the, kind of the crux of the question, isn't it? When, when does a person exist as Christians? We believe in conception, and scripture 
you know, <coughs> points that out in some areas as well. But uh, on the other side, for somebody that's not a Christian and they're still an American, mm -hmm. you know, they, they may not believe that. So we need to be able to convince them. And based on some of our previous discussions in other classes, you know, le leaving, you, know, you don't want to say you leave your faith aside, but we need to be able to convince them somehow that at conception, that is a, a human being. Right. So trying to prove to them other than just using the Bible. Okay. So they're going to say, well, the Bible is not, you know, not the Constitution. Right. Not, you know. And that's a valid point. We're not so discussing... Uh, right. Or, and we believe that. Right, but but it's a yeah it's a valid point that we can I can show you and you can show me because we both believe the same the the source the the source of our belief is the same. But how do you confront somebody who uh, doesn't doesn't share your worldview your your uh, your origin of belief? Uh, that's, that, and we're going to talk about that, but that's a, that is a difficult, difficult, difficult thing to answer. Um, should the government, you know, and, and this may for, uh, this, this may be kind of a sub point to the first question, but should the government assume a moral stance on abortion? So you, you believe, do you believe, I only heard one person, so let's, do you believe that the government should, A, say that base legislation, regulations on abortion on medical, scientific, uh, objective type of things, you know, it is risky, uh, there's possibility of injury, that kind of thing, or, on the other hand, should it be because abortion is wrong? Okay, so who, who thinks that it should be based only on medical, uh, medical reasoning, evidence, those kinds of things. Okay. Who thinks that it's more appropriate for the government to say it because it's a moral argument, because it's right or wrong? Okay. So. Does it really matter? As long as, as, long as it doesn't happen, I don't think it really matters why it doesn't happen. Like, mm -hmm. if, if we have to make it illegal by saying that it's, like, it's dangerous, or if we have to make it illegal by saying it's morally wrong, I guess as long as you can get rid of it, it doesn't matter how they mm -hmm. say it. Okay, so Abby? If you have like court, court cases about abortion, it would be easier to back it up with the medical stuff rather than you know a judge saying that he didn't feel like it was morally right because that wouldn't that be going against what we talked about last week, like his own personal judgment. Like, okay, and that's how do you handle that as obviously some of this stuff is just laws, you know, you broke a law, but when it comes down to judging, when it comes down to your call on that particular issue, how do you as a judge make a decision, a moral decision, uh, without having bias? How do you avoid personal uh, views on abortion if you're trying to decide a case? Um, okay, so we're going to talk about these things, and that, that it seems some of these are very like, oh yeah, definitely, or no, definitely not. But this issue, um, this is a this is a very tough issue, and and I personally, um, I think that this issue of abortion, uh, because first of all, because of its own merits. So in other words, we need to tackle this because of because it is in and of itself worth taking on. Abortion is worth handling, it's worth discussing, it's worth arguing uh, out in and of itself. But I think that the ramifications, the ripples that are co gonna come out of this issue will be so widespread that it's going to be the most significant issue decided in our country since the ending of slavery. And I think that, that I think this is a critical, critical thing for us to discuss. I have a question. Mm -hmm. the government should. You know, we get to the point where everybody has their opinion. You know, the opinion is, you know, should there be an environmental situation? Should they be here? Should they govern and everything? And then all of a sudden, should the government should govern, give the people opportunity to do their government and handle their affairs. 
you know, it always come back to the government, and if this group don't like it, then they complain. And this group, the government shouldn't be involved in this. Uh, and they, they talk about two different issues, but yet, yet they uh, want to agree on this issue, and this issue, they figure the government shouldn't be involved in this issue. So somewhere down the line, uh, there has to come a, a agreement between somewhere, you know, how, to, how do we do this right. in an orderly fashion. Okay, and then a lot of times that's that, that the orderly fashion part is why the, the government ends up having to get involved because when it comes to big groups of people, like three, four hundred million people, how do we all work together on things like that? If, if the government, if, if you have to be very really careful because if the government says it's killing, it's killing, period. Mm -hmm. But if the moral issue comes into public, but then people that are not Christians or they don't believe, then they say, well, I don't care, I'm not a Christian, and I should be able to get abortion. So it's really, it depends how the government is going to position it for people to accept. You're going to call it, it's killing Peter. It has nothing to do with moral issues. Keep the mm -hmm. morality out of it, and then it's done. Kill it. Okay. Uh, abortion is killing. You're killing a life person, especially when they kill them so they can use stem cells. That's killing. Right. They say, oh, no, like Mrs. Regan, she thought, uh, that they should take steps so and help her husband, but that's killing one person to make another well. Okay. And that's a good point, that uh, if we decide this based on um, legal precedent, based on uh, cultural views, uh, would, would that make it easier for everyone to comply? Because if, if it's based on religion, that gives people an out. They say, well, I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to do that. It's okay for me. Now, is that true? No. But that's the common feeling that if it's okay, it, it may be okay for you, may not be okay for me, but we're two different religions. We're two different backgrounds. It's okay. Um, and that's, that, that's, a very, that's a very relevant question. Can... You know, as we as we get further into this, I think we'll we'll, we'll cover that. But uh, it's a very relevant question: if, Are we giving people an out by making it a religious issue? So, what does the Bible teach on abortion, on government's involvement in abortion, on uh, when is it an abortion? Um, I the the Bible would teach. And I, and I can get, we will go through multiple, multiple passages of Scripture to demonstrate this. The Bible teaches that humanity begins at the moment of conception. Luke 1, 41 through 44. Could someone go ahead? I'm going to be putting up uh, four passages, and I'd like someone to go ahead and read uh, the first one, Luke 1, 41. Do I have a volunteer, Jeremy? Okay, Psalm 51, 5. Abby? Psalm 139.13. Okay. So. Oh, okay. That was it for now. My mistake. So, Luke 1, 41 through 44. Okay. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard that the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to, to me, that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? To me, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Okay, so we've established at this point Elizabeth was about six months pregnant. So what Abby mentioned earlier of you know, regressing back, uh, we know that according to the Bible that the baby was clearly alive in a medical sense and shows human qualities at six months within the womb. So it says that it, it, it gives emotion and there is joy, there's action, so, and there was recognition somehow. We don't know if it was divine or if it was um, physical because we've seen through medical technology that babies in the womb can hear 
uh, what's going on. So we don't know if it was just purely physical that John heard uh, her speaking or if it was divine that the Holy Spirit, uh, even inside the womb, that the Holy Spirit moved on him to, to respond that way. We don't, we don't know, but it's clear that whatever the cause, that he certainly had human qualities at this point. Okay, Psalm 51.5. Okay, so this is David talking, and he says that his, his conception, at his conception, he was sinful. Now, this is a negative example. This isn't like the, oh, cute. No, this, this is talking about our sin nature. But he's saying that even at the point of conception, he had the quality of being a sinner. He had the quality, or he possessed a sin nature, even at conception. Okay, Psalm 139.13. Thou hast possessed my veins, thou hast covered me with my mother's womb. Okay. So this is more the, the quality of me. Did you hear that in the verse? He says, you covered me. So he is identifying himself as a person before he was born. So when we think of ourselves, we're not thinking of, I didn't become a person until I left the womb. According to scripture, we are self-aware before we are born. So, we have established that pre-born children are human beings in the eyes of God before they are born. We have established that they have a sin nature from the moment of conception. We have established that they are, they are attributed personal characteristics. They are attributed personality at the moment of conception. Okay, another passage that we're going to look at deals with accidentally causing a miscarriage. In Israel, there were regulations on uh, personal conflict. So someone could look up Exodus 21, 22 through 25. Eric, do you want to... Uh, Exodus 21 through t- 21, 22 through 25 talks about if two men are fighting and one of them accidentally hits a pregnant woman, uh, it deals with the consequences for whatever happens next. You want to go ahead and read that passage? If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief followed, he shall be surely punished according to the woman's husband lay upon him. He shall pay the judges determined. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, strike for strike. Okay. So Exodus 21, 22 through 25 says there's two possibilities. These two men are fighting and without malice, without intent, they hit a, a woman who's pregnant and they cause her to go into labor prematurely. So if the baby is born, it's healthy, the mother and the child are both fine, there's still a penalty, and that's set by the husband, and that penalty is paid to the judges, and that's made right. So in other words, no harm was done, but interestingly, there's still a penalty. We might say, well, you know, all's fair, you know, Interestingly, that's not the case. There's still a penalty, even though no harm was done. On the other hand, we see that if the baby is prematurely delivered and it's a miscarriage, that the penalty for accidentally causing that miscarriage is death. It says an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, etc. So it's saying if you take that life, your life is forfeit. So what really makes that hit home is if you study the rest of the law, when you, what happened, does anyone know what happened when you accidentally, uh, the illustration given in scripture is you're, you're chopping wood and the ax head flies off the handle and hits someone and kills them. What was, what, what follows? Okay, they had to prove it was an accident. 
and there was one other component. He had a, a refuge, though, too. Okay. Until things were straightened out. Right. There was a city of refuge. Uh, there were multiple cities, and, the, and the, the scripture lays those out. There were multiple cities throughout Israel that were called cities of refuge. And it's similar to our concept of being under house arrest. Uh, when somebody is under investigation or in trial for a crime, that they've not, it's not been proven one way or the other. A lot of times they'll be put under house arrest or restricted to a certain area. And in scripture, this is a similar thing. If you accidentally killed someone, you had to go to a city of refuge, and then you had to prove before the judges it was an accident, and if it was, an, if it was considered accidental, there was, there, was no, there was no penalty. It was just, it was very unfortunate that it happened, but because you were not responsible, that you were not considered guilty. Okay, Exodus 21 shows that preborn children in Israel had higher legal protection than anybody else. Because, like we just said, if you, if a man accidentally killed his friend while they were out chopping wood, the axe head flies off and kills the other guy, he was granted protection from retribution. And if it was proven that it was an accident, then it was, it was let go. Okay. There was, no, <clears throat> there was no possibility of refuge for someone who accidentally kills a preborn child, someone who causes a miscarriage. Okay, if you caused a miscarriage, you died. That was how it worked. So, preborn children had higher legal protection than anybody else in Israel, which is interesting. Uh, we also have to consider how does that affect our view? Okay, we, we see that Scripture certainly carry stiff penalties for accidental death when it comes to preborn children, how then would they have handled deliberate abortion? Okay, because we're not, in our culture, we're not talking about two guys were fighting and one of them hit, hit a woman or shot a pregnant woman. Or, we're not talking about an accident. We're talking about deliberate, premeditated, thought out abortion. So, Scripture clearly lays out that a person is a person before they're born. That a human, genetic human being is a person, has humanity before they're born, all the way up to the moment of conception. And that in Israel, there was a stiff, stiff penalty placed on anyone who caused a miscarriage. So how do these things shape our view of the present day practice of abortion? Is there any possibility in Scripture that that would be okay? Okay, and I'd like to go ahead. I have this written down in the book here. There's one thing I'd like to point out that Dr. Grudem notes. He says that um, one thing that some people will say, and um, and he he deals with this as if they are true, as if they're right. So he's saying that some people will say that depending on the sense of the passage, um, in other words, how you interpret the original language in this passage, Exodus 21, 22 through 25, that there's, uh, depending on how you interpret it, that you, can, you might interpret it that you're only fined if there's a miscarriage. In other words, the penalty is a fine whether there's miscarriage or not. And he says that, f he, he does note, first of all, there's very little support for that translation, that interpretation of the passage. Um, but he said that ultimately, all that does is show the same thing, that children before they're born are given legal protection, that they're considered alive before they're born. Uh, so he says, even if you take the most liberal interpretation of Scripture possible, there is still no room for arguing that people are not human, that people are not, uh, don't have a soul, etc. There's no room for that in Scripture, even if you're interpreting it as liberally as you possibly can. And I thought that was a pretty interesting thing to, to say because that doesn't give us any wiggle room at all. There is, you know, he's arguing there's no way 
you can interpret Scripture. And not just this passage, but the other passages, Luke, Psalms. It's like there's no way that you can interpret away the humanity of preborn children in Scripture. So if you consider Scripture to be your foundation, you have no choice but to acknowledge that children are alive, they're human, they have a soul before they're physically born. So I don't think Scripture leaves us any room to view them, view preborn children as anything less than completely human. Now, as far as abortion, we're going to we're going to continue to talk about this because there are some there are some issues that because we live in a in a an imperfect world that we're going to have to face. But I think that it is totally totally right without any kind and any shadow of a doubt to say that scripture teaches that we are human from the moment of conception and that we have a soul uh, that we should be protected. But and this is, this is something that Doug pointed out. Not everybody is going to say, oh, well, if it's in the Bible, then okay. Now, that's, that's just the world that we live in. Jim? All right. Now, the baby is considered a person at conception. Uh, the people who want to abort the child, what would they worry about if they think the baby's not a person? What would they want to abort if it's not alive? It's a valid question, but then what they're going to say is that it's just like removing your appendix. Why would your appendix is not, your appendix is, it's alive. It, your appendix has cells that are alive, it's part of your body, it's just like your hand. My hand, my hand has life, and it's animated, it functions, it moves, it responds to the rest of my body, there's cells in there that are alive. Um, but my hand is not a human being. It's part of me. It's part of a human being. So what they're going to say is that it's alive in the sense of there are cells that are dividing and growing, but that it's no different than a tumor or an organ that's defective and needs to be removed. And I think that's why we need to focus not just on the medical definition of life, <laughs> Uh, but on the the moral definition, and that's something that we're gonna we're gonna keep talking about. But there is there, that that argument does have some merit. That if it's not, why, why are you trying to why are you trying to to remove it? Uh, do you think it's alive or not? And you know, when do human beings begin? And this is directly addressing what, what Jim just brought up, that when do human beings begin? Scientific Myths and Scientific Facts by Diane Irving. And um, she's, uh, this, this article is, I think it's very, this is what I was going to be handing out. Uh, unfortunately, I just uh, did not work. But this is a very, 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 very good article. It's, it's very um, medical. It's not, a, it's not like, light reading, um, but I've re I read through this and it's extremely, extremely good. Now, um, I don't know as far as those of you who are um, under the age of 18, uh, if your parents are comfortable with you reading me medical descriptions about reproduction, but talk to your parents about that. But as far as we're concerned, this is an extremely good article on when not only we, when is conception, when does life medically begin, when does humanity begin. Diane Irving basically her, um, her reasoning is that some people would say, uh, and a lot like what Jim brought up, that um, they would say that if you think abortion is morally wrong, if you think aborting a baby is morally wrong, then you're also morally objecting to any kind of destruction of any human cell. Because their argument is that the embryo is just a human cell, just like a, uh, a heart cell or a brain cell. Um, and their specific argument is that, like for instance, the egg. Um, <laughs> that the egg is a human cell, and it's destroyed in the process of reproduction. 
So we have a problem with that. Um, and Diane Irving basically refutes that completely, totally, scientifically, that, um, the, the, for instance, the egg only has 23 chromosomes. Now, I don't know it, how much medical background you have, but we have 23 pairs of chromosomes in each of our cells. Chromosomes are just rolled up DNA, uh, and we've talked about the, there's X and Y DNA, and um, really they're both X's, it's just that the Y, the, the bottom half of the X is folded together. But anyway, um, 23 pairs of those. And um, what she's saying is that those are not, for one thing, they're a specific type of cell. The egg is a specific type of cell. It only has 23 chromosomes. And um, that actually does not allow it to be considered, um, you can't consider the egg a human being because it doesn't have 46 chromosomes. Genetically, it's not human uh, in that it can't, re it can't split and divide itself and create a human being. But she says what happens is at fertilization, at conception, that now you have 46 chromosomes. Now you have a viable human being. You can take that DNA and copy it, duplicate it, and make a human being. So she's saying the moment of conception, scientifically speaking, is when you stop considering a person just cells, but you start to consider them a human being. She says that's the moment when those two pairs of chromosomes come together, when those two sets of 23 chromosomes bundle together, that is the moment, scientifically speaking, when we have to start to consider someone a human being because they have a new set of DNA. It is not the mother's DNA, it's not the father's DNA. It's a new, unique set of DNA. And, it's a, and the, by that definition, then, it's a new person. It's another, a third person. Who's going to determine when that time, when that time uh, happens? Well, in her case, she determined it scientifically, that there is a moment at f what we call fertilization where those 23 pairs of chromosomes join. And basically what happens is um, it, your DNA, uh, have you seen pictures of DNA, graphics of DNA? It's basically a, a, a twisted ladder. It's like somebody took a ladder and just twisted the two ends in opposite directions. So it looks, it's called a helix, a double helix. And during fertilization, what happens is, well, normally when your cells divide, that ladder unzips down the middle. And each half falls away from the other half and then builds new, an identical counterpart. So in other words, you have two halves, like a starfish, when you cut off a leg on a starfish or you cut a starfish in half, it grows back. Our DNA does that. It splits down the middle through RNA unzipping and rebuilds itself. So now you have two sets. Okay, what happens during fertilization is those two halves the 23 and the 23 are unzipped, but then they're joined together, they're, they're put together. It's not duplication, it's synthesis. You're not just copying one and making it to another, you're taking two and merging them together. So instead of just sticking an article on a photocopier and running a copy, you're taking two articles, putting them in a word processor on your computer, and making a new third article using only the words in those first two. So that's, it's like your, it, it, that's, that's about the only analogy that, as far as our technology, that, that makes sense. That we're taking, you're taking two sentences and making a new third sentence using only the words in those two sentences. And taking two papers, making a third paper using only the words from those first two. That's what's happening. And so she says that that moment, which is a scientifically discernible moment, that's when the person is created. And for purposes of arguing about abortion, it's, if you're watching that closely, you're not going to have, it's not like we have the technology to say, oh, oh the, the, the RNA hasn't joined yet, it's still okay, they're not a person yet. For our purposes, we can't really, we can see that happening 
but we in practice you can't be observing that actually happening inside the body. And how would they go in and eliminate half the DNA when that process is started? Well, and that's that's what I'm saying that we don't have the technology to once once the process has begun, we don't have the technology to stop it without just completely destroying uh, the, the surrounding tissue and the embryo and everything. So we're not talking about, um, you know, we're not talking about something that, uh, that we can necessarily measure out and know exactly, okay, if you do it by this time, you've stopped conception. Um, now we may get that technology someday, but According to Dr. Irving, there is a scientific point at which a person physically becomes, genetically becomes a human being. And we would take that a step further, saying that human beings are given characteristics according to God, like a soul, personality, emotion. We would say that if they've become physically, genetically a human being, that we would have to attribute them with uh, physical... Uh, or I'm sorry, spiritual value as well as physical. Um, and I, I really, th I, I, I'm really irritated that that article didn't print out because I think you really have to read the whole thing to understand it as well as she says it. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't distill it down uh, well enough for it to still, to still uh, carry the full weight that her writing does. And this is, like I said, this is not... Her arguments are not made from a, um, a spiritual standpoint. Uh, and I don't mean that, that she's not a believer or that she doesn't believe in God. But I mean, she's, she wrote that article just out of medical and scientific evidence. So this is a very strong resource when you're talking with somebody who doesn't believe the Bible. Uh, that, you know, basically what her writing, what her work has done, and not just her, there's others too, but her her writing leaves no very 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 little room to argue that somebody is not a human being in the womb cuz like i said we're not talking about well there's one exception to this but overall we're not talking about whether it's one month or the second trimester or the third trimester when it's okay to abort according to what she's saying in her article and according to what we've read in scripture once someone has been conceived, there is no, they, they are a person, and there's no uh, grounds to consider them otherwise. And if they're a person, then we have to treat them the same way that we would treat people sitting in this room. It wouldn't be okay for me to walk up and kill any of you. Why would it be okay to kill a person in the womb? So Dr. Irving's article, I highly recommend that you read it, and if you'd like a printed copy, come and see me. I'll, I'll get one to you. But she's arguing that humanity begins when the chromosomes of two separate individuals are joined by fertilization. And like I said, how would people react if we apply the same treatment to uh, uh, we're okay as a nation with abortion? What if we did that to children who have already been born? One of the reasons given for abortion is um, defects. Um, so if during the course of your life you have a serious accident at work and uh, let's just say uh, let's just say that your back is broken so you you know you can't walk anymore uh, you have no feeling um, pretty much half of your body you know doesn't work would we kill you would it be okay to kill you because of that defect. Um, you know, uh, would it be okay, since it's okay to terminate unwanted pregnancies, would it be okay to terminate unwanted children? Like, man, you know, times are tough. We just don't have the resources to take care of you anymore. Would that be okay? We have a problem with people who just abandon their children let alone somebody who just decided to kill their children because they couldn't support them anymore. Jim? When did premeditated uh, abortion start, actually? Uh, it's been around millennia. Uh, we've known about, uh, before, um, 
the, the, the medical procedure we use for aborting today is not that old, but um, they use, basically what they did was they induced a, a miscarriage or they induced labor before the baby could, um, could survive. And so um, it was usually th things that they drank. Um, sometimes they would purposely fall or um, they would basically some kind of physical uh, way of starting labor. Um, so the reason I asked is the founder of uh, Planned Parenthood, the mm -hmm. reason why she started Planned Parenthood, uh, it's a man named uh, racist. Uh, um, uh, people that probably wouldn't give birth to uh, smart children. Mm -hmm. And that kind of gets into eugenics, which is a, another issue all by itself. Uh, but selective, like selective breeding, for lack of a better word. Um, well, and they actually went into black churches and tried to get the preachers to tell the, uh, the black woman that it was okay for them to get abortions, just so she could eliminate the, the black children. And I don't know. I I've not read that myself, so I would. Yeah, if you want to send that to me. Um, but there have been, there's been a lot of talk about uh, eugenics, which is just eliminating uh, lower, uh, you know, people who are considered unintelligent, that kind of thing. Um, and there's some people who do think that abortion is a, is a, a good way of doing that. Um, other people, it's just that the resources, they think, well, I don't have the resources to take care of this baby or this baby is going to have a birth defect and they'll live an awful life and they'll be a burden on us. These are all reasons that people use, but when we think about those reasons, when we think about children who are already born, none of those would fly. Nobody would, n nobody would be okay with that. Although, there is, on the other end of the spectrum, at an old age, there is some uh, there is some thought there of that there is a point, and, and that's not a new idea either. Euthanasia is not a new idea. We'll hopefully get to talk about that. But objections. Okay, preborn children can't survive without the mother. Okay. Uh, don't think there's a lot of ground for this because children that are newborns can't survive without their mother either. And by, like, they can't survive on their own. Now, obviously, if you can substitute, like, they can still eat and things like that but they can't survive without someone taking care of them, is, is what I'm saying. So, um, you know, the fact that they can't survive independently of the mother, I don't think that's a really valid argument because after they're born, they still need, they still need a mother after they're born. So would it be okay then to, to kill them after that? Um, birth defects, we talked about this, that the idea of would it be okay because someone has a defect to end their life because it's going to be a painful long life? Um, well, the problem is, and this is something, I, and I know when I was talking to Paulette, this is something that she had, had heard. I don't know if anyone else has, but uh, a, a professor was talking about basically the mother and father, the mother had tuberculosis and the father had had syphilis. And... Um, because of that, uh, th those two diseases give a very high chance for birth defects, genetic disorders, et cetera. So, you know, the first child was blind, the second child died, the third child was deaf and, uh, deaf and blind, the third child, or the fourth child had tuberculosis. So after those four children, what would you recommend as a medical student, what would you recommend to the mother on the fifth, for the fifth child? They knew that they were going to have a problem having children, and they went through four of them already. Shouldn't they have done something to not have children? Okay. So like, should uh, they even be allowed to have children? Tooth tied or uh, okay. whatever. As a medical student, what would you recommend? I might be wrong on that one, but I'm not, I don't know. Okay. I guess this question come into 
I get uh, counseling, counseling me and people. Okay. Uh, I think that's where it comes from. Okay. So. I need to back up on one thing. Uh, what, who can make the decision where uh, if the mother is carrying a child and uh, one or the other will have to, to go? Can't we're going to. We're going to talk about that, so we'll hold that thought. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, in the, the particular quote that this, this, the, the writer was, was quoting, the, the person the writer was quoting, uh, one, one student raised their hand and they said, I would recommend an abortion. Okay, and we also, counseling, contraceptives, but they said, I would recommend an abortion. Knowing that all four previous children have had problems, the fifth is going to have a problem too. And the professor immediately said, congratulations, you just killed Beethoven. Because Beethoven was the fifth child of a woman who had tuberculosis and a father who had had syphilis. So even, you know, even recommending that they not have more kids is kind of like, wow, imagine Imagine that even, not even an abortion, but just imagine what we would have lost, the contribution we would have lost. Um, so we also know from scripture, you know, that when Jesus healed a blind man, he said, you know, this man wasn't made blind because of sin. He was made blind so that I could show my glory. So are there consequences for sin? Yes. But sometimes God providentially causes these things in order that he can show his glory. Um, so sometimes we can't know the consequences. Uh, most of the time we can't know the consequences. Would I be wrong in that aspect of evidence? I don't know. Um, a Catholic would say you were okay. uh, because they are opposed to contraceptives of any kind based on that. I, um, no, I personally, I don't, I don't think that you'd be wrong for saying that. And I also think that God will have his way. God will, in his sovereignty, make it happen if, it, in spite of whatever we may try to do. Um, pregnancy resulting from rape or incest. They would say this is a valid reason to abort the child. Well, I disagree because pregnancy, the, the, the child is not responsible for the father's sin, the father's crime. Why would you kill a person based on who their father was? You know, I... I don't, I never knew growing up anybody who was uh, born because their mother was assaulted or from incest or something like that. But would it be okay to go up and say, you know what, you're the product of a crime. Your father, you know, your father assaulted, raped your mother, so you should die. No, that's not valid. And once again, these are all assuming that we have proven that a person is human at conception, medically speaking, and, and spiritually. So this, these are things that you would have to tackle after having made the previous arguments. Uh, now, this final one are, is choosing between the child and the mother. Um, this is a case which is extremely delicate because, and this is why I, this is why I was so careful to say, that we cannot think of unborn, preborn children as anything less than human. I didn't say that there is absolutely no room for uh, terminating the pregnancy. And it's because of this. This is a very sensitive area, but if you had to choose between the mother and the child, not, not even necessarily that, if you had to choose between the mother and the child dying, or just the child dying, what would you do? Wouldn't that be the mother's decision there? Well, and I think I think the, the family would have to. I certainly think that's a family decision. But would it be, regardless of whose decision it is, is that room that you're? Are you allowed to make that decision, regardless of who you are? I mean, personally, uh, why why lose two people when? you only have to lose one. Does that make it any less, does that make it any less tragic? Does it make it any less of a burden? Does it make it any less of a difficult decision? No. I don't believe that we should choose to have two people die when only one has to. 
let's flip it around the other way. Um, if you could save your child, or both of you could die, what would you do? Would you be like, well, I don't want to make that decision, so we're just both going to die? Or would you save your child at the expense of your own life? So when you can't, when there isn't an option to save the child, but there is an option to save the mother, that's a decision you'll ha you, you may have to make someday. I don't know. But personally, I think that is the only grounds for what we would consider to be abortion uh, or terminating the pregnancy is when you have to choose whether the child is going to die or the child and the mother. So, but that's a deeply personal decision, and I don't think I can... I, you know, I've never made it. I don't think I can really counsel people in that, that area. Do you think God puts that on the same scale as abortion? If, if there was a choice between saving a child and saving a mother, do you like, personally believe that God would hold you as responsible? Because I, don't, um, I don't believe so. And I think the, the reason I'm using the word abortion is just because that's the, the term for it. Um, but... I, I don't think that that's something where you would have to be knowing that it's knowing the child is going to die either way. I don't think that's something that you're accountable for. Uh, and I don't think we may medically call it an abortion. I don't think that would be the same. It's not the same as um, terminating them out of convenience, for instance. Some people also say it's a restriction of freedom and that we can't impose our will on others. Uh, I don't think, and this is where it comes down to government, and we've got to wrap this up, but when it comes to this, um, the question isn't about restricting freedom or imposing our will. The question is, is it restriction of freedom for me not to drive 100 miles an hour down this road? Okay, is that a restriction of freedom, or is that promoting the welfare of the people? Is it restricting my freedom to kill people or is that promoting, if I, you know, I'm, free, I'm a free person, I have the right to do that. No, I don't because they're trying to promote the welfare of the people. And I don't have the right to take a life because, first of all, that's not considered by the government. That's not considered my right. And second, it's bad for somebody else. So we're not talking about restricting people's freedom to, say, wear pink or, you know, stay up after 11. Okay, we're not, we're, not, we're not talking about those kinds of things. We're talking about does someone have the right to take someone else's life? And our country has decided no. And the Bible says no. Now, the government has the right to execute uh, prisoners, execute, you know, criminals. Uh, the government has the right to wage war. Uh, but we as individual citizens don't have the right to take a life uh, out of convenience, out of anger. Uh, and I don't think this is an issue of us imposing our will because we're not saying that you need to be a Christian and you need to do this because you're a Christian. We're saying, you know what, they're alive. This is a person. You don't have the right to take their life. So we're not talking like like she had mentioned at the beginning of class, we're not talking necessarily about you need to do this because you're a Christian, you need to do this, you need to be a Christian. We're saying this is illegal by the definition of American law. This is illegal, you're taking a life. And that is a right that we also think is restricted by the Bible. So there's legal precedent and we also have religious precedent that scripture tells us we don't have that right. Like I said before, I think this is the single, the, the, the way this all comes out, shakes out, is going to have some severe implications for our country. I think it's the biggest thing, um, the biggest moral issue that we'll have decided since, since slavery. And I think, you know, like in the, in the previous slide, there's 50 million people have been aborted in our country. That's a lot of people. Think about how many people died in World War II under the Nazis. How many people died under Stalin? Okay, so th th this would be, if it was, if it was anybody but pre-born children, this would be considered genocide. So <clears throat> we need to think, do we, are we going to sit back and let this happen? Or are we going to take a stand <clears throat> and, and make, a, make a big deal out of this? 
Um, now, because we have to close, uh, we won't have time to discuss the other three issues. But next week, we'll be talking about the issue of marriage. Uh, I'd like to send you some prep material through the week uh, for this, so stay tuned to your email inbox. But we need to go ahead and close. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we need to stack the chairs, and you're dismissed.